burst into tears, you know, I'll just start straight up crying. I am whining like nothing I've seen before, you know. And I haven't tried that stuff before, you know. It's just such a big, you know, relief getting it done finally, you know, after hunting around for so long and then getting it done on a Samba deer, you know, which is pretty hard hunting. Big Buck Registries Deer Hunting Podcast, episode number 233. Ulrich Orskov, Danes, Bull Tar, and Dirty Steak. Support for the Big Buck Registry and the Deer Hunt Podcast comes from Black Ash Outdoor Products. Reduce your risk of tree stand suspension trauma with a tree stand wingman, the tree stand emergency descender system, the Enforcer. Take control of your odor footprint with your personal ozone generator, the Rack Packer. Don't drag your deer out of the woods like a caveman. Never drag a deer again. No need to kill yourself dragging a deer when there's the Rack Packer. Use the promo code BIGBUCK, B-I-G-B-U-C-K, at checkout to earn free shipping at $23 value. Go to therackpacker.com. Covert scouting cameras, remote cameras for hunting, wildlife, and security. The Horny Buck Seed Gummy. It's all about the freshest seed. Morse's Sporting Goods, a full line of sporting goods without the sales tax. Northwood's Common Sense. New England's finest white-tailed deer lures, 100% fresh, pure, and undiluted. And Big Buck merch. For only $19.99, you can get a cool, high-quality Big Buck t-shirt and show support for this podcast by visiting www.bigbuckregistry.com forward slash M-E-R-C-H. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hey, this is Adam Hayes from Team 200 and TheMoonGuide.com, and you're about to push play on one of my favorite podcasts, the Big Buck Registry. Hi, this is Barry Wenzel from Brothers of the Bow and Trophy Whitetail Boot Camps. I'm not really sure what a podcast is, but you're about to push play on what is now my favorite podcast, Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. Hi, this is Ben Rising with Whitetail Edge. Sit tight because you're about to listen to the best podcast that you possibly can listen to, the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, fellow predators. My name is Jay, and thank you for tuning in to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. For Dusty Phillips and Jim Keller and the entire staff here at the Big Buck Registry, welcome to this week's show. There are a couple things I'd like you to do for us if you could. If you would, please check us out on iTunes, subscribe, and leave us a review. With your help, we're going to try and push this show up the iTunes charts. I know we have a lot of listeners out there, and I need you to take some action. I need you to leave a review and subscribe to the show. If you do subscribe, that'll give you access and notification each and every week that a new show is released. You can also access this show in its entirety on YouTube, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, and Google Play. It's all right there for you to access on demand at your fingertips. Regarding the harness program, we have an ample supply of harnesses to give away from our volunteer donors. If you're in need of a full body harness, please send an email to j at bigbuckregistry.com. Hunting outside of the United States summons the need for a new set of hunting styles and strategies, much like we see when we are looking at East versus West hunting within the U.S. Ulrich Orskoff is as passionate a big game hunter within his home country of Denmark as most of us are for whitetail or muleys. At home, Ulrich hunts the familiar European deer like fallow, roe, and red, but often ventures to the rugged mountains of New Zealand in search of bull tar and sandbar. We break down Ulrich's strategies and styles of bow hunting in each country and learn why a walking stick while hunting the mountains of New Zealand is worth its weight in gold. We'll turn to our full interview with Ulrich Orskov in just one moment, but before we do, let's turn to Jim Keller with the Deer News. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Our first story this week, preliminary Vermont deer hunting numbers released. This story is from the WCAX CBS Channel 3 website. Vermont wildlife officials say preliminary numbers indicate hunters had a successful deer season. Officials say a total of 15,949 deer were harvested during the 2017 seasons, the third highest since 2002. That breaks down 
into 3,585 for archery season, 1,461 in youth season, 7,272 in rifle season, and 3,631 in muzzleloader season. They say the legal buck harvest was 8% more than the previous three-year average. The higher harvest, officials say, was due to the mild winters of 2016 and 2017, which allowed more deer to survive. The 2017 final numbers are set to be released in early February. Test results show no CWD in wild deer. This story is from the Message Media website. No chronic wasting disease was detected in more than 11,000 precautionary samples from deer that hunters harvested this fall in north central, central, and southeastern Minnesota, according to the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. In all, 7,813 deer were tested in the north, central area, 2,529 in the central area, and 1,149 in the southeastern area outside Deer Permit Area 603 the CWD management zone. Researchers still are submitting samples from cooperating taxidermists, so final results will be updated online at mndnr.gov forward slash CWD check as they become available. Given no deer with CWD were found in north central and central Minnesota, the DNR will narrow surveillance next fall to areas closer to the farms where the CWD was detected. A fourth precautionary surveillance area will be added in fall 2018 in Winona County because CWD recently was detected in captive deer there. Minnesota's CWD response plan calls for testing of wild deer after the disease is detected in either domestic or wild deer. All results from three consecutive years of testing must report CWD is not detected before DNR stops looking for the disease. Three years of testing are necessary because CWD incubates in deer slowly. They can be exposed for as long as 18 months before laboratory tests of lymph node samples can detect the disease. Proactive surveillance and precautionary testing for CWD is a proven strategy that allows the DNR to manage the disease by finding it early and reacting quickly and aggressively to control it. Precautionary testing is necessary to detect the disease early. Without early detection, there's nothing to stop CWD from becoming established at a relatively high prevalence and across a large geographic area. At that point, there is no known way to control the disease. Complete information about CWD and DNR efforts to keep Minnesota deer healthy is available on the DNR website at mndnr.gov forward slash CWD. Archery buck proves to be Pennsylvania state record. This story is from the OutdoorNews.com website. The Pennsylvania Game Commission announced in a news release Thursday, January 4th, that a trophy whitetail rack shattered the previous state record in the typical archery category. Ron Shawless of West Newton, Pennsylvania, harvested the trophy buck on October 24th with a compound bow on public land in Westmoreland County. The rack had a net score of 185 and 4 eighths, which surpasses the previous record of 178 and 2 eighths from a buck harvested in Allegheny. County in 2004. The 13 point rack was very symmetrical and lost only 7 and 7 eighths inches in side to side de- deductions, which included an inch and a half abnormal point off the right side G2 point, said Bob D'Angelo, Game Commission Big Game Scoring Program Coordinator. That's not much in deductions on a set of antlers this size. The rack had 25 and 26 inch main beams, more than 11 inch G2 and G3 points, a more than 20 inch inside spread, and 4 and a half inch or better circumferences at the four locations where circumference measurements are taken on the main beams. Last year, a buck taken in Clearfield County had scored 226 and 6 acres, which was a new number one in the non-typical archer category. FBI awards Winchester with a new ammunition contract. This story is from the OutdoorHub.com website. The Federal Bureau of Investigation has completed an extensive evaluation process and Winchester has been chosen as its primary source for 40 caliber Smith & Wesson pistol ammunition. This includes a bonded jacketed hollow point, service cartridge, as well as full metal jacket and frangible training loads. Winchester has been supplying the FBI with service and training ammunition for many years and is honored to be awarded the most recent contract and continue to support our nation's premier law enforcement agency. The 180 grain bonded jacketed hollow point cartridge was selected by the FBI is designed with patented technology that utilizes a reverse jacketed bonded bullet that can penetrate a wide variety of intermediate barriers while still maintaining very consistent target penetration and reliable expansion. The nickel plated cartridge prevents corrosion and ensures smooth feeding and extraction. Flash suppressed powder is used in the cartridge to maintain an agent's night vision and meet the FBI's stringent darkened range evaluation. The FBI uses one of the most rigorous ammunition tests ever developed, and we are very proud that Winchester was identified as having the best product performance, said Matt Campbell, Vice President of Marketing and Sales for Winchester. 
That concludes this week's edition of the Big Buck Registry's Dear News. For links to the stories featured this week, please check our show notes at www.bigbuckregistry.com. If you have any ideas for future topics or have any questions about any of these topics, please email me at jim at bigbuckregistry.com. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller for the Deer News. Well, thanks to Jim Keller for the Deer News. Without further ado, here is Ulrich Orskoff. Ulrich Orskoff, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. How are you, my friend? Thanks, Jay. I'm feeling good. I've been looking through your podcast, and it seems like you've got a freaking load of whitetail deer stuff on there, <laughs> and I don't know anything about whitetail hunting. Good, good. I'm glad so, you don't know anything about it, because I don't want to talk about whitetail anymore. <laughs> Righto. Well, it should be easy. <laughs> I can, actually, I take that back. I do want to talk about white tail, but not on this, sh- this show with <laughs> you, you can, today. Okay, yeah. Now that sounds good. Excellent. Sounds good, man. Very nice, man. So, I, you know, I've, I've been watching your videos. They're pretty intense, and uh, there's, uh, they remind, I mean, it looks like you're a, you're a bow hunter. Uh, you explore the vastness of the world. Uh, you, you hunt big game. Uh, you've had some pretty close encounters with some boar, and uh, you're into this thing, and and we we love passion in deer hunters and hunters in general especially the, the the guys that are and gals that are going out there and they're hunting big game with primitive bows and getting it done and hunting vast terrain we find that absolutely fascinating mm. you're one of those guys so i'd like to explore you and your life and try to figure out how you put all this together and and mm. uh, find out what makes you tick yeah, well, it's a thing that's been growing on me, so didn't didn't start off that way. Okay, well, let's go um, way back then. When did, when when was your first recollection of any of this stuff kind of popping into your head? Well, I've I've been chasing you know small animals since I was a kid, you know. Okay. And um, but I mean the first real thing because I was hunting around with the bows like everyone else is doing, you know, when they're kids. Yeah. Um, well, like a lot of people do, anyways. And I <clears throat> I remember I was ten years old and. I was out on this, not that my dad does it a lot, but he was taking me out and my brother out actually on sort of a survival trip thing. And um, <laughs> we're out on this lake canoeing in and um, we're sleeping in the tent and that. And then there was these tame ducks down and down by the riverside. Hmm. And uh, I remember going down and I'd been shooting a lot with the bow and I was pretty efficient, you know, and I was asking my dad, he was out on the, what do you call it, out in the, out in the lake sort of thing on the, uh, on the walkway. And I was I was yelling out to him if I could shoot one of the ducks, and he was like, "Okay, you got to be real quick because there's people coming." And uh, I remember I I actually lured them in with with bread, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then I pre- pretended sneaking up on them, and actually I ended up shooting one of these ducks from a meter away, just down through the spine and everything, and it was flying out in the water, and I was running out and getting it. And- <laughs> You know, grabbing out the arrow and running back in land and hiding. Because then these immediately after these people come in the in their canoes, sailing in, and I'm just hiding up in the forest with this dead duck. And yeah, it was it was pretty intense. So yeah, that's one of my memories. I think that was the first bit of game I shot with the bow. Really? Yeah. Okay. All right. Very yeah. cool. Excellent. But I've been shooting. I've been shooting mice and all sorts of other stuff. But then I sort of I sort of moved away from you know shooting with the bow when I got to when I turned 16. Okay. Because then I could get my hunting license here in Denmark, and so I started hunting with a shotgun. I got my own Irish setter, and we hunted, you know, partridge and pheasants and woodcock and all that sort of stuff. And then, sure. and then I started getting a little bit into the rifle hunting, and I sort of realised that Denmark, you know, Denmark is we've got a lot of hunters here compared to how much land we've got. And so price is just, you know, whenever there's sign of red deer, you know, price is just skyrocket, and you can't get especially when you're young you can't really get close to any good hunting um so i was starting to look out and then i was also trying to get into the vet studies at the same time which meant that because i didn't have the grades at the time to get into the vet studies like they take 50 percent into the vet studies with the grades and then 50 percent on the second quote where things like farm work counts and so i was looking for farm work and hunting and then you know new zealand was just ended up being being perfect for me okay and so that was sort of the first trip I did, you know, outside of Denmark hunting. Gotcha. Yeah. So De- Denmark, that's your home. That's where you're from. Mm. And wh- yep. is there a rich hunting heritage in Den- Denmark? We don't hear much about Denmark in the States. And it sounds like there's, a, with as many hunters as you just described, sounds like there's a, mm. a, a rich culture there. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, I think there's a, 
there's a better culture in Denmark, but it's not as old as, say, the English. Okay. I think we've got a lot of hunting culture from Germany and maybe Britain as well. I'd say mostly Germany, but I'm not really, you know, I'm not really that much into my hunting culture, really. Um, so I don't know how long it goes back, whatever. Gotcha. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, like any place else, we've been hunting for, for thousands of years, you know, but sure. hunt, hunting culture-wise, yeah, I'm not sure. What, uh, <laughs> what What's a hunt like in Denmark? Is it a, 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 you said it's a culture thing. Is there, do you have a group that you hunt with or are you a solo guy? Oh, you can do, you can do, well, most people go out, you know, a bigger group. Um, but, I mean, there's different, like we've got the buck season, roe buck. So roe deer is the thing we hunt the most. Then you've got the red deer and the fallow, and which is when you're accessing land with that, you know, it's um, it's, a, it's a lot more expensive. Um, but it's, most of the land is private. And, um, and, yeah, if you don't know any people, you know, you, there's just a lot of hunters and not a lot of land. Um, the one thing we do have though is the public waters. So every every bit of water that's that's basically salt water, um, you can you can hunt for free. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's that's a that's an awesome. So that's our sort of public land. That's the water. So you hunt water. waterfowl. You you hunt waterfowl for free on the water. Yeah. Which okay. Is awesome. All right. So, yeah, so I've done I've, I've done that a lot as well. So you get waterfowl for free, but if you want to go hunt the big game, yeah, you you have to hunt private land. Yeah. It's expensive. Yeah. And so, the, the but the game itself, the big game itself, uh, the roebuck, yeah. the red deer, the fowl, that sounds very much like the European deer that you've got to find pretty much yeah. scattered across all of Europe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's a bit of sea care, but not really, not a lot. Okay. And then we started to get a bit of wild boar up in, in Denmark as well from Germany, but they've, they've got an old, they've, the, hunt, the hunting season is all year round because they're afraid because we produce that many pigs in Denmark that if they take, you know, any any airborne diseases or whatever, bring them up into Denmark, it's, it, it could be devastating to the, to the, to the pig farming. Okay. All right. Yeah. So living in Denmark, do you get to engage in some of the big game hunting there? I uh, recently only, uh, only for the, cause, cause in Denmark with the bows, you can only hunt up and up until the road deer. So you can hunt road deer, you can't hunt fallow with a bow. And that just means it's, it's hard going. And, um, yeah, but recently I did for the first time, buy myself access to a bit of private land with some other guys so we're four we're four bow hunters now and we've got a relatively large area uh, i think it's 250 hectares which is which is pretty darn big in denmark especially for four guys and so i'm lucky to have become part of that and it's it's been my first season now and i managed to i managed to wound a buck with the bow from a tree stand and then i had to get a guy with a dog to come and track it up for me and then he he shot it with the shotgun so it wasn't the experience I was hoping for because I've been chasing, you know, these right. rodeo for a long time. But they're just really skittish and they're so small. And you know, season starts in the beginning of May, and then after that, you know, vegetation just starts to explode, and so it's just it just becomes really hard to find them. And yeah, right, like like rabbits, but yeah, like rabbits, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> a bit bigger than rabbits, but yeah, hard to find. Right, right, they're they're sneaky and they're, and, they're... and pretty unpredictable. Like you don't, you, it's hard to put a pattern on them. I think. Yeah, gotcha. What's your what's your favorite species to hunt now that you've hunted um, a variety at this point? Oh, that's a good question. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. I'm going to have to go for the tar right now. They, they they fill up so much of my head. You know, I'm thinking about it a lot. So tar is a, is an awesome species to hunt. But sambar deer is also yeah. I love hunting sambar too. You said it's, so. It's called a tar. Yeah, tar. Tar. Where, and yeah, where are they? Cool. Where are they located? So they're in the southern southern island of New Zealand. Okay. And been brought into New Zealand from from the Himalayas back in the in the beginning of the 1900s and yeah they were brought in as a present. I think they brought over put eight eight tar on a on a ship and then they sent them as a present and then I think three of them died and so they ended up with releasing five tar and now they're just spread to the thousands. I wouldn't even dare to guess how many there are, but there's so many now that the the government. Yeah. They, they're going to have to, you know, they're culling them from the helicopters um, year round. So they're flying around killing these things because what they do is the tar don't really, in the big mobs, they don't really move off, move off from a mountainside until they sort of graze down all of the tussock. And that means the tussock dies. And then when the rain comes, it sort of erodes the mountain. Yep. And so that's the number one reason I think that they're culling them is because of 
erosion of the mountains. Right, because they're causing yeah. erosion. Yeah. It's crazy so, how the cycle of life and the, the geography and all your landscape is related yeah. to the animals and upon which grow there. Yep. It is crazy. It is a bit crazy. So sandbar and tar, those are your two favorites. Yeah, probably at the moment, but it's hard. I mean, it's hard to sort of pick, pick them out. But yeah, right. no, they're, they're good animals to hunt for sure. So you, Interesting. Denmark home is home. And yep. you've New Zealand sounds like almost like a second home to you. Yeah. And yeah, it's it's becoming that. Yeah, <laughs> becoming that way. Yeah, New Zealand and Australia, but I think sort of New Zealand is, is growing more in me. Even though I think I almost spent as much time in Australia, um, I think it's just the landscape and the and the people. It's uh, yeah, and 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 of course you know the freedom to you know because there's not much you know and that's the thing I, I found that I really hate it's just paperwork and all that sort of stuff and it's just basically none of that in New Zealand rig you know hunting wise explain that a little bit it's especially compared to, to, to Denmark um, well you can go to New Zealand and you can get your um, you can get a hunting license for not your, you get your hunting license for free you can do that you do that online and then you can get your uh, firearms license and you pay twenty five dollars for that you you do need need to know someone that lives in the country and they need to have a firearms permit as well but you can basically when you've got that that information from someone there you can basically go in and buy a rifle and then go hunting for free on the public lands wow year round year round no bag limit <laughs> yeah so, so there's not as much red tape uh, as you would have to go through in in Denmark for sure. Yeah. Um, how does that compare to the states as far as, as your, you have the paperwork that you have to process in yeah. order to hunt here? Yeah, yeah. I, I did. I went to Oregon, and okay. that wasn't that actually wasn't bad. I, it was. Um, I mean, it, it varies from state to state, obviously. But I was able to go into the to the office, you know, the same way. And it, Oregon wasn't bad, you know. So or, Oregon was pretty good. I, I got the you know the tag, but that was still you know you tag in for one animal. You buy the tag for a for a uh, you know an elk. Which is what we were after. Yeah. So I bought that, and that was pretty easy. Yeah. Okay. All right. So okay. So New Zealand is kind of like your second stomping grounds. Yeah. Denmark is where you live. Uh, it doesn't sound like you engage in a whole lot of hunting there, just because it's a bit more difficult to do, uh, except for your private lands. Yeah, I, I do when I can because now I'm sort of into it, and so I do both waterfowl now and and <clears throat> and the uh, air, and chasing roebucks. Okay. And hopefully soon legislation has come is um, well actually we're we're going to go into a trial where we can hunt fallow and and, uh, and red deer as well with the bow so that's going to be really exciting. Oh wow! Okay, yeah. very nice. Yeah. What uh, what does hunting mean to you? Like at, personally, what's your philosophy? <laughs> well, I think that might be a big word. I don't know if I've got a philosophy of hunting. Okay. Maybe maybe if I start to think. <laughs> um, Look, hunting, um, to me, hunting is something that I see hunt, the hunting instinct as something that you're born with, you know, like all of us, you know, um, hunters that are really into, I think a lot of people are born with, I think it's in the genes, you know, it's in the genes whether you, you feel like a hunter or not, whether you feel like you, you I mean, because I was running around as a little kid chasing animals, so it's something, it's not something that you choose to do, it's just something that you can't, it's something that I can't help myself from doing you know what i mean right. and but also i mean people that haven't been exposed haven't had the environment to to grow their hunting instinct a lot i see a lot of people i teach hunting license as well in denmark and and i see a lot of older people like uh, 30 year old 40 year old wherever and they get into the hunting take the hunting license for the you know and then they it just explodes on them some people just go crazy you know oh they just experienced it now or why didn't I see this before or do you know what I mean? Right. So these people, they have the hunting instinct. They just haven't been exposed to it. And uh, I think a lot more people have the hunting instinct than, than we realize, you know. So um, I don't know if that was a hunting philosophy. It is. Philosophy, yeah, no, it but, definitely yeah. is. It definitely is a philosophy. So I think it's in all of us, right. in, in a lot of us, in, in, in different degrees. Okay. So you, probably, you, not in, probably not in all of us. <laughs> would you say that... I agree. I think it's in a lot of us. I think it's yeah. like a natural instinct. But yeah. do you think it uh, it's a, a right that people should have? Oh, mate, that's a tough one. It's I a think. Deep one, uh, right? Yeah, yeah, I think it is. I think like if okay, I'll put it this way: if people, if other people are, are still allowed to eat, you know, produce meat, 
definitely. It should be a right to, to go and be able to, to harvest your own meat. Okay. Yeah. All right. You are uh, you're seem to be particular to the traditional bows, the recurves. Hmm. How did you get into the recurve instead of, like, the compound? Well, I mean, that's at the moment. It's not that I – well, the way I got into the recurve is, well, I was hunting when I was young, like I said, with, with a longbow or sort yeah. of like a plastic sort of thing. And, and when I started, the way I got into the boning was actually my friend back in 2012, we hunted New Zealand for the first time. He traveled down there with me and we were hunting with the rifles mostly, but he brought his bow along, dragged it freaking everywhere, even though it was a you know, massive hassle going through all the bush, you know. Yeah. Um, he dragged it around and then back at a farm where we were working, he was just shooting the arrows, practicing, and that was actually what ticked me. You know, it, it, it had been probably, you know, eight years since I last sh- shooting a bow, probably, since I last shot a bow. And um, I remember just seeing him flinging the arrows and it was just, it just caught me, you know. I just realized I need to start shooting again. So you spent some time. I want to talk about the tar a little bit more. You're, so it's your favorite species to hunt or maybe maybe your favorite species to hunt. Yep. Tell us more about the tar. How do you go about preparing for a hunt? What's the terrain like? What what type of skills and techniques do you need to pay attention to? Oh, that's a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, I'm going to try to boil it down. Um, so tar hunting in general. I mean, tar... I haven't hunted. First off, I'd start looking at the seasons when you want to hunt the tar because in the winter time they'll be up high, um, and there'll be there's going to be. Oh, it actually varies. I haven't hunted them in the winter because of all the snow and because of the weather and because how things just you know can turn in no time. Um, so I've only gone sort of in the in the springtime and in the in the summer and yeah. So the tar usually hang high, but in the springtime they'll come lower down to feed, which is probably the time of the year where you'll have the best chance of bow hunting them. Okay. And um, yeah, so that's what I did this time is is is, uh, is I went for the tar in the spring. And um, so a lot of people hunt the tar by going up into the big big rivers with the four wheel drives, and then they you know sit down with their spotting scopes and try to spot out the tar especially if, you, if you're a trophy hunter and you want to know if, if it's a big bull or not it it's it's pretty hard with the tar because the small tar is like a young tar is like 10 inches 11 inches and you get the bigger mature ones is is anything above 12 really um so it's only a couple inches that that separate them from from being young to mature if, if you're a trophy hunter if you're after that and i sort of with the bow hunting i've sort of grown out of i see it as people try to challenge themselves in different ways you know Mm. people with people that do a lot of rifle hunting you know they want to challenge themselves on on finding that big mature one animal whereas i'm with the rear curve i can't i just can't afford to be picky you know if if i ever want to kill something you know what i mean right all right so the so with the with the tar hunting what what's the strategy as far as the approach Mm. with with a bow you got to get close you said that you can't be too picky but What's that? What's that strategy like? How do you get close? What is it? A spot in stock? Do you have to be quiet? Are they? Yeah. Okay. Recall. You're gonna respond to the calling or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. So the tar, they're pretty. You know, they've got a pretty strict pattern, especially. Um, yeah, I wouldn't know it's. But yeah, they're pretty hard. Easy, they're pretty easy to pattern, which, mean, which means that if you watch the tar, usually they'll hang high during the day, bed down, and then they'll come lower down to feed. And um, that, that's what you really want to, you know, you want to pay your attention. You want to see which way they move down because that's often the way they, they're going to move down every, you know, every afternoon, every every night. All depending how much hunting pressure they have, you know, they'll, they'll come down even at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and then you can you can make your setup, you know, the day after or you can try to make your move in on them. Um, so you want to... Well, you want to move in on them when the wind starts to go down, obviously. Um, okay. So you can go in on them in the afternoon or in the morning. That you know they'll they'll you'll see them make their way back up back up into bed. But in places where they they're not hunted as much, I mean, you know, they've got a longer they ha- they they hang out more. Okay. So like like any other species, you know. Okay. So you can follow yeah. a pattern of of, yeah. of where they're going to routinely end up. And yeah, are you hunting the the trails? 
coming in and out and are you on the ground? Are you on a tree stand? How it's, does that work? It's, it's a lot of, no, it's, it's open. It's all, most of the places it's open. Um, and so you spend a lot of time behind your binos. Okay. It's a lot of time glass in these, these big faces. And that, <clears throat> all depending how you hunt, if you hunt from the, from the bottom of the river and then, and then make your way up. I mean, that, that's hard going because you're going up and down, up and down every night. I prefer to. I prefer to. You know, either you can get a helicopter in and you can you can cam high. I haven't done that. I've done it once where I was actually taking out another guy to get a tar. But you can you can get a helicopter in or you can walk your way up a ridge and then camp on top of the mountain because that way you'll be able to. If you're not sure where the tar are, you know, you'll be able to walk the the ridge line of the mountain and then glass down um, and you'll be able to stay on top of them and then you can actually move down while they're bedded. Or and and you know get ready for when whenever they start feeding around their, their bedding area. Gotcha. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of different tactics, but being above them where they can't, because you know they're always looking down. They they don't expect danger to come from above, so that's what I enjoy the most is being on top of them. And then because that way also you'll have the entire day when the wind is coming up to hunt them. Whereas if you're below them, you sort of need the the down drifting wind to to actually get close. Right. Yeah. Okay. And so. In reality, the terrain is kind of rugged. It sounds like mm. they, they like mountainous terrain, like a yeah. like a mountain goat almost. Yeah, yeah, oh, definitely. Like right. it's it's unbelievable the places you'll see them just jump around. You know, sheer sheer rock faces. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> in order to get above them, you're going either for a hike or you've got to find it, another mode of transportation in. It sounds like air is a pretty uh, it, the comfy the comfortable way to get in. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So and so yeah, there's a lot of tar on public land. So there's a lot of there's a lot of hunting that can be done, but it's also on public land. It's a it's really hit and miss. Like you can walk for miles and miles, and you won't you won't see the tar either because you know you've had the helicopters in there and shoot shoot the hell out of them. Yeah. Or because you've had poison. That's a thing that they also do in New Zealand. They poison areas, but the official explanation is is um, killing possums. So that's like a what do you call these types of animals? Um, it's it's like a big ro- is it a rodent? It's not really a rodent. It's yeah, like, um, kind of like a what rodent. Do you- sure. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, go, I'll trying, go with the rodent. Trying, yeah. Yeah. So they're, so they're trying to kill these possums because they eat the trees, um, or certain trees, and they they spread tuberculosis. I think that's the official reason. But in the at the same time, they kill a lot of deer and they kill a lot of tar. Or maybe not that many tar, but but the ten, tar that hang lower. Anyways, what I'm saying is, hunting public land can be really hit and miss um, because they try to control the numbers in that way. Yeah. Okay. So right. it can be really hard going, which is why if you don't have a lot of time, which I mean, two weeks is not really a lot of time to hunt public land, um, you're gonna want to want to see a guide if, if if you've got expectations of coming out with something. Okay. Yeah. In the, the terrain that you're on, you you have to get close. How close are shots that you're taking? For me, with the bow, I am right now, or when I was hunting, because it sort of varies depending what shape I'm in. I mean, I'm sh- I shot the tar. I shot. Uh, I got this time. I shot from 12 meters. Okay. But that was that was in the thick life. That was you know. Yeah. Where I was actually able to get close in the in the open. I wouldn't. I mean, I've I've come to 20 meters quite a few times. But that's two years ago. The thing was back then, I just wasn't really in the zone for hunting the tar. And what I mean is I was just coming straight from doing exams back here in Denmark and just basically hopped on the plane and uh, <coughs> I just hadn't practiced enough with the bow to, to be comfortable. And I hadn't killed animals for probably a year and a half before that with the bow. So I didn't, I wasn't in the zone, which meant that when I got to 20 metres of that tar, I felt like I was just pushing closer. I didn't feel like shooting. And I, I pushed into 13 metres once, I remember. And when you get that close, you just can't, you know, you, it's just hard going. You yeah. know, you just can't move and then, you know. The, and as you're you're approaching the target, yeah. are you are you uh, standing still? Are you, like, sneaking around through rocks? How does how does that final close occur? Yeah, well, when I when I got my tar, so that that is actually a bit different from from other ones that are in the open. When I got my tar, it was in the thick scrub, like I said, and and so it was more sort of um, it was it was spot and it was stalk and spot, not spot and stalk. Do you know what I mean? It was you were sneaking around, and then oh, you seen a tar, and um, I was just going so slow that um, he didn't notice what I was, 
and I was coming over this, there was sort of a ledge, like a spur coming down, and I had branches in front of my face, and he had branches in front of his face, and so he really couldn't, he couldn't pick me out, and I was just, I was walking with a stick, and I found that to be awesome, because you can just go slow, mm-hmm. and I was, had this, you know, this stick, walking stick wrapped around my um, my wrist, and I was trying to get that off and put that down, and then he started whistling at me, which which is what they do when they try to, you know, alarm, sort of an alarm sound. Really? Okay. So, yeah, so it's sort of like a whistle with the sneeze, like, you know? Yeah. So he started to sneeze at me, and you know, I was trying to, you know, turn my way around slowly. Like, it was only my face that was, that he could see. Got an arrow, knocked, turned around slowly, and, and then I sneezed back at him, and then he freaking, he started, he started coming towards me. And I just got, he, he was coming from only 17 meters, and then he started walking towards me, like, can I start to turn around slowly? And all of a sudden, there's a tar bolting out from below. And he, that caught his attention and he, he runs out to this small ledge and he just stands there looking down and there's a small tree behind his face and me, which means that I'm able to sneak up on this ledge and just take a step to the side and, and from there and I can just put, from, he's, he's quartering away and I'm just putting in this arrow like just instinctively and just passing through him. And he just shoots out like a freaking, I've never seen anything like it. Like he just goes out horizontally, like, I'd say 10 meters. He, it's just crazy. He just blows out of there, and he's just gone in a, in no time. And I'm like, what the hell just happened? Mm. I didn't. I was I was doubting myself so much about how that shot was. So okay. And yeah. what what's the track like when you try to recover the animal? The track. Oh, the, the, the tracking. Blood, what do the blood, blood trail? Uh, yeah, the so blood I, trail. I went down. I took my time. I don't. You know, I don't want to push him, especially when you're not. If you're in doubt, how if you, if it was a marginal shot got down arrow was full of blood and i was like okay it's looking a lot better than what i thought you know it had it had lung blood on it so i was like maybe i've got one lung maybe two i sat down then i made a small fire and i waited for a bit more than two hours and then i started tracking it and um yeah he, he'd only i was tracking it and only small specks of blood because they've got a lot of big hair on him mm-hmm. and so it can take a bit of bit of time before the blood to, to pour out and also because it, it ended up being a high lung shot it sort of you know it wasn't pouring out and um yeah i when when i ran out of blood in the end i was uh i was just thinking okay i'm gonna and i was running out of light as well i was just thinking okay i'm gonna have to try and do a grid search and just search from wherever i think he's he's gone you know and and just almost then i, I found him immediately and it was just, it was, you don't, yeah, I just, it's hard to explain what a, what of um, um, what do you call it, relief it was, you know. Right, it was right, pretty, oh, yeah, yeah, definitely, right. Yeah, it was pretty intense because, yeah, I'd been chasing them for a long time and, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you're, you're on a mountain, sounds like, you're in the thick stuff. How far from yeah. base camp are you? Um, how far, well, there's, there's a lot of vertical meters in between because I'm camped high. Sure. Um, how far? I'd, I'd rather say in time of walking, <laughs> which is probably around two hours, two and a half. Okay. But it all sort of varies, you know. All right. Um, so you really how, how are far, relying on a, on a campsite almost to stay overnight. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's it's rarely, you rarely find tar close to, well, you'll, you know, maybe private land, you'll find them hanging closer to the tracks and all that. But uh, no, public land, you, yeah. You, you're going to either have to walk or you're going to have to get a helicopter. <laughs> gotcha. All right. Yeah. So you're you're camping out. You're there for the night and then yeah. figure out a, a way, way – I mean, two hours is no joke. Mm. So, And that's two hours is, is actually not a lot in New Zealand. Like it's often you, – you, it's easy to do five, six hours. That That's pretty normal to get into – to get into some good hunting. Wow. Okay. And it, and it's a lot of uphill and downhill, and which is why, you know, the stick, like I said before, it's almost become like when I was hunting that tar, I was almost like I'd trade my – I'd give away my binos to be able to keep my stick, and that's the first time I realized how important that stick was, you know. Right. Yeah. So a stick, is, a stick is really good when you want. I mean, I think the studies say that you can go like 20% further sort of thing, and, and you really feel it. With a stick. really – and, yeah, and you really feel it when you when you're sneaking as well. When you're doing this sort of hunting, um, the uh, the stalking where you, where you're stalking, and then you can spot them anytime. A stick is really an awesome tool because you don't you don't have the sort of sudden movements like you have, you know. Imagine you're stalking through the woods and you've got a small twig to step over. Yeah. 
and you've got a long step to take and that's going to cause you to move fast just to get over the stick whereas with this with you know you've just got a third leg to put down with the with the walking stick and it just means that you can sort of flow through the woods instead of you know making these jerky movements all the time which is what i find the deer to be catching hmm. you know these sudden movements yeah okay interesting perspective this is a this is a, a different perspective uh than we usually see you know it's not the it's not the standard whitetail hunt it's a, it's a much yeah. much more rugged um, mountainous type situation fascinating mm. so that's your that's mostly your new zealand hunt it sounds like this is a, a new zealand kind of thing mm. what about the sandbar where are you hunting the sandbar yeah sam- so they're called sandbar mm-hmm it's, yeah, and they're they're in Australia. They're they're on on New Zealand as well, but they're on the North Island. And I think it's hard. I, I, I'm not too sure, but I think it's harder hunting sandbar in New Zealand than it is in Australia. I mean, bush is not as thick in Australia, and the hills you're going to be <clears throat> you're going to be hunting are, are not as steep. Uh, so, and there's a lot of sandbar in Australia. A lot of sandbar if you're in the right places. Okay, all right. And so I'm look. I'm really looking forward to going and, and hunting sandbar again. And um, so they're just a big animal, large animal. You can sort of compare them to the elk body-wise, not as big. They'll be the the sandbar are the third largest um, of the deer species. So you, you ha- you've got the moose and then you've got the elk and then you've got the sandbar. Okay. So they're not quite as big as elk, but they're up there. And um, huge animals and they're really, once you've hunted them for a while and you, you see how they walk about and how they react when they see something, you know, you find they're really inquisitive. Like they're not, they're really, um, yeah, I don't know if inquisitive is the right word, but they're, they're interested. When they see something, they don't, if, if they're not, if they don't, if they're not sure what you are, they'll hang around a bit and they'll, they'll try to, you know, what they do is they honk. You should try and if you've got access to it now, you should you should try and uh, put it on YouTube or something. It sounds like a freaking I don't know, like one of those horns you've got on the on the stadium, yeah. you know, like one of those <laughs> right. fan things. Yeah, it just and when you and, and if you're not prepared for it, you know, if you're just walking through the woods, you know, and you hear one of those, you know, you jump, you freaking yeah, you get really scared. You can you because it's so loud. Huh. So loud, yeah. It's it's pretty. It's a cool animal. It's a really cool animal, and uh, I mean, it's good because it's a big target for me. You know, I've got a bit longer, a bit more of a range. Like I wouldn't, I'd be able to shoot out to probably twenty five meters, okay. which is I don't know, close to thirty yards, I'd say, on a sandbar, because um, they're so big. You know. Sure. Okay. When I'm thinking, when you know, I'm com- comparing it to roadie, which is just tiny. So. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. But the sandbar, they're probably, just to add, the sandbar probably also some of the hardest deer to hunt because they're so alert mm. and because they, they don't move a lot and it, you'll just be amazed how quietly these big animals, you know, will, will sneak through the woods, don't make a lot of noise and stand still a lot and they've just got massive ears. So they've got a, got a lot of good sensors on them. Mm. Gotcha. Do you care about scent control at all? No. No. Not really. Okay. Which I know is a massive thing in the States. For yes, some people, it can um, be. and you know, I've had my thoughts about. I, I thought about it a lot. Sin control, and I mean, when the wind is good, you don't need sin control. Right. When the wind is bad, um, I think only. I mean, maybe because I mean, there's got to be a threshold to how much a deer will take before it registered registers as it as a threat. You know what I mean? Right. Before it clicks, and I think if you can reduce the amount of scent coming out of your stuff i mean maybe but it's just way too much hassle for me to for me to care about if you because yeah it's i I would say it's i'm guessing it would only matter in 0.5 percent of the times where you're hunting that's my idea of it you know i haven't done studies or anything but yeah it does seem that if you're in a camp a camping environment where you can't get to a base camp where you can really Mm. hone in on scent control Mm. that it's almost pointless uh Mm. and that you're better off just trying to play the wind completely than trying Mm. to reduce your scent cover unless you're in fairly easy ground to cover and not far from base camp Mm. but 
when I'm saying that, I understand, I completely understand why you would want to do a lot of scent control if what you're doing is sitting in a tree stand and only that. Correct. I mean, right. you, you want to, I mean, you want to do whatever gives you an advantage, you know what I mean? Right. Even even if it's a 5% advantage, you know, you're going to do it because you spend that much time in the freaking seat, you don't want to miss out. Right. So, yeah, I completely get it. Yeah, I can see, I but mean, if you're moving around all that time anyway, yeah. then the scent control probably yeah. isn't going to help a ton yeah. with all the movement <laughs> you're making. But, yeah. yeah, you're right. If you're sitting still completely, yeah. a tree stand or just on the ground or in a, a blind, scent control matters a lot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I could have – and like I said, I haven't done the type of hunting, so I don't, I've only made my own thoughts about it. Yeah. Right. Let's uh, – you got a, a video award um, the, yeah. from the, the Monocular. Yeah. And it was based around a video that was, I think, fairly viral, right, on – social media and it was yep. you taking a shot at a boar that then charged you yeah can we talk about that a little bit no that was a pretty uh that was a pretty intense situation um well that was in uh that was in australia and i was hunting it was a bit of private land i was hunting um yeah i've been hunting there for for a few days and i was hunting with my friend espen and um but we was we sort of split up and hunted our separate separate ways, and um, all of a sudden I was actually after fallow bucks at the moment. But then all of a sudden I just see this this you know black spot lying out in the open. I put up the binos and I instantly I just see these big freaking tusks sticking out of his mouth, and I just realised he's got to be a you know a big fellow for me to be able to see it from this distance. So. So I just quit everything I was doing hunting the deer, and then I just, you know, snuck down. He was sleeping. He was fast asleep, and I think it was 9 o'clock sort of thing. Um, <laughs> I mean, he, 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 was, he was, I don't know if he was, well, he, yeah, well, you could only see him from above, so he was probably, I mean, hunting hogs can be can be different in Australia compared to other states because if you go into places where they're not used to being hunted, you know, they're like differently, but um, they're still, anyways. Yeah, they're, they're still skittish in this area. So I made my way down slowly, and uh, wind was good all the time. So I was rushing in the beginning, getting down quickly, and then slowing down once I got closer to him. And he, I could just see he was still sleeping. I was putting up the binos every time, you know, check in and got in. Wind was still pretty decent, you know, sort of going sideways. And um, I remember getting into, yeah, probably 15 meters, mm. which is 19 yards sort of thing, and then stop there and then i just look and that's actually perfect i love you know shooting an animal that's that's either looking away lying down bedded or sleeping because you know you can take your time and that animal's not going to move you know and that right. gives you the time to to take a you know a really good shot so right, right. i was just taking my time looking at the heart and then you know i just that's what happens you know i just draw back and, and shoot sort of and just on the routine really and then uh yeah i noticed i hit him straight in the heart and i'm like relieved i'm like yeah good shot you know and and then i realized you know he gets up and then he sees me he sees the movement that i make bringing back bringing the bow down and i shouldn't have made that made that movement because that just made him come for me you know i'd woken this boar and yeah he just wouldn't wouldn't have it you know so he let me have it and uh he, he just came charging at me full on and i remember well the thing that that struck me first or the thing that I knew first was I hit him so well that I knew that he wasn't going to be able to make it for more than 10 seconds, you know. And so I just knew that I had to keep him away from me for 10 seconds. And and that's what I managed to do. So I just timed it and put my foot in his face <laughs> <laughs> and uh, landed on my ass and got back up and he came at me again, you know, and I kicked him again in the face. I think this time I was still standing. Yeah, I was. And, and then... As you watch it in slow motion, you can see how he tries to hook me, you know. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, then he was – after that, he was – I was backing off a bit and trying to sound big. I don't really sound big when you hear the, the video. It's more so like, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> but then he was just out of breath, you know. I could I could tell. And he backed away and he, he, you know, just succumbed to the shot. And, yeah, I was able to walk up on him. I had like a – I carry around like a video camera on the hip, and so I put on put on the uh, put the big camera on instantly on him, and I filmed him as he uh, as he was uh, dying, you know, and yeah, passed out, and that was it. <laughs> gotcha. All right. Yeah. So, so it the, was pretty it was, the, was pretty intense. That's the story behind the video. Gotcha. Yeah. Now you're uh, when you're out in the the field um, hunting, let's say the tar, right? Hmm. Your your gear setup 
starts with your recurve bow, and we, we understand that part. What other gear are you traveling with uh, aside from your bow and your walking stick? Is there anything, what's your, uh, your clothing set up, and is there anything else that you bring with you? Okay, so usually, you know, I pack down a big pack with everything, which means tent, sleeping bag, all that sort of stuff. Okay. GPS, <clears throat> big camera. Sometimes I start. I even started carrying around a drone because I've got so really? much. Okay. I've got, yeah, I've got so much lightweight gear now. I mean, sleeping bag and all that. When you pack, when when you've got the lightest weight gear, gear you can on your essentials, you can start bringing more food or whatever. All right. Anyways, um, yeah. So I bring in a backpack of everything, and then I usually, you know, I set up camp, and then I from there I I, uh, I day hunt, and so I just bring a smaller pack and. Um, and that, that includes, like, I've got a, um, which is something you really need in, in New Zealand, um, like an e-perb. It's like, um, do you know what an e is? Like a yes. locate, locator, yeah, it's a locator beacon. beacon. Yeah, yeah, locator yeah. beacon. Yeah, locator yeah. beacon, yeah. Yep. So I'll carry that. Yeah, it's carry common. Carry knife, uh, carry, yeah. E-perbs are common in, uh, in oceanic uh, boats and things like that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. So carry that, carry the knife, and carry food for the day. Carry, like, a rain jacket, of course. I don't really, I don't really carry rain pants because... It doesn't matter too much. Um, and then I carry the camera and the walking stick, binoculars, of course. Um, yeah, and that, that my – what is my clothing setup? I run around in Sitka gear. I'm using mountain pants. Okay. Working very well, rugged, and, um, you know, you don't really feel your – there's no restriction in the, in the movement. So I like that. And then, yeah, and what I like a lot is the uh, Merino base layer. Yeah. I'm using that a lot. So merino is definitely something I bring all the time. Merino that, and then a buff as well. You know the buff? Buff. Explain it. Yep, a buff like the one you uh, neck gaiter. Neck gaiter. Okay. Yeah. You call so, it a buff. Um, all right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um. So that those are probably my, my most important pieces of clothing is is the the neck gaiter and the uh, and the long sleeve merino for the base layer. Okay. And um, yeah. So it's it's a setup that's working. I mean, there's a lot of other options out there, but yeah, it's been working pretty good. Gotcha. Sometimes I, sometimes I carry a tripod, but not not a lot anymore because I mm-hmm. started, you know, just it, it can be a bit of a hassle. So yeah. Okay. All right. Very excellent. All right. So let's <coughs> let's uh, turn to a, a memorable deer hunt. I had asked you in the beginning to think of one. I don't mm. know. If, hopefully, we haven't covered it yet. Um, no. All right. No, I don't. I don't think we have. Well. I've got two to choose be- between from, and um, I've got one time where I hunted a Samba deer, and then there's another another time I shot a big rooster stag. But I mean, I think the the one that made the most that made the most impression on on me was definitely the Samba deer. Okay. Even though it was a hind, it was a it was just a crazy experience, and there's also a video of it. Okay. Um, online night now, so I think it's it's more relevant to talk about that one. Okay. Um, well, I, I come straight from New Zealand, so I came from Denmark. I was doing like a, I was I was taking a half year break from the studies and um, came straight to New Zealand. Hunted tar for two weeks um, with the bow. Didn't get one. Um, got my friend one with the. With the rifle, got him a chamois as well. Then I had a friend come down from Denmark, my friend David. He came down and we hunted red stags in the raw mm. in New Zealand. We hunted for three weeks and he had a camera guy with him, a photographer that did a lot of filming. And uh, we hunted the red stags for three weeks and we didn't get one. So it was really hard going in New Zealand. Then from New Zealand, I spent two months there and then I went straight to Australia. And I hunted fallow, I think, for probably two weeks. Mm. And it was just dry and it was just after the rut, so it was really hard going. And then I was like, fucking, what am I going to do? And it was, yeah, it was just getting really tough. And then I was like, okay, I need to get some softer ground to walk on. And I was starting to look south and I wrote up my mate, oh, what am I going to do? This and that. And he suggested um, I could hunt Sambar deer down south. And I knew of this guy that's on YouTube as well. His name is on YouTube, his name is Captain Bowman. Captain and, uh, Bowman. <laughs> Captain Bowman, mate. You need to go look him up. He's okay. got so much crazy good footage. All right. Um, yeah. Anyways, I'd been talking to Captain Bowman or Carl Brown is his real name. All right. I'd been talking back and forth with him before about hunting. and But so I wrote him up and I asked him if he knew of any good public land hunting spots for, for the sandbar. 
and um, yeah, he asked me if, if I had a four wheel drive or two wheel drive, and I you know I was only running around in two wheel drive, and I asked him if I could pay him to drop me off somewhere, and he was like, um, yeah, just come down and, and we'll, we'll suss it out, and um, I went down and. Yeah, we had a good talk, and I actually ended up. He was taking me out on these hunts, and I ended up staying at his place, sort of on and off. Like I was doing my own hunts out of there as well, but I was staying in his in a camper van at his house, um, on and off for six weeks, probably. It was pretty pretty wow. crazy. All right. Yeah, yeah. No, we ended up getting getting along really well, and he was taking me out. Like he was running his own thing at, at his garage, you know, so he could sort of plan out his own work. He's a he's a dude. He's probably what. Oh, 60 years old sort of thing and uh, yeah he was taking me out and showing me around these these different spots on the on the public glen and we were doing all these day hunts and we've probably been going for a week and i actually oh i missed a fellow buck just then yeah mm, mm. um anyway so it was really hard going and i ended up saying to asking him if he could just instead of going back and forth every day if he could drop me off out in, out in the forest and uh so he dropped me off with all the uh no actually what we did before was I wanted to because I'd been going for that long without killing anything. I wanted to kill something just to get back into the rhythm, like like I uh, talked to you about, you know, the thing I had with the tar. Yes. And so we went for a goat hunt, and these were not easy goats. It was a hard goat hunt, but I ended up killing a goat, and we got it on film, and it was just perfect. So I had a bit of meat, and then he dropped me off in the forest after that, and so I had my tent, I had loads of food, and I had a bit of goat meat. And, uh, yeah, I was just ready to stay out for, I don't know, a week or so. And um, so I think first day or second day, it's just pissing down. And I end up spending probably, I think it was 35 hours in the tent just because I had forgotten my rain gear, you know. Oh, okay. And I, I just couldn't afford getting it wet, you know. That would, ha- that would mean I'd have to go out. And so... I think on the third day it sort of cleared and then I had a good hunt that day, had a good look around the area. And then the fourth day in the morning, um, it's still a bit drizzly, uh, but I just don't want to be in the tent anymore. Like it really sucks staying in that one-man tent. And so, Right, by yourself. Was, yeah, 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 <laughs> right. by myself. And, you know, what can you do? I mean, you're toasting a bit of bread and that. But um, right. So I'm sneaking out and um, it's a really good day for it, like – there's wind in the trees, it's coming down with rain, and it just means that the senses of the deer, you know, they're sort of disabled because they can't hear a lot. And, yeah, so they just hunk, hunker down somewhere and they try to get out of the wind. And so I get to this tight gully. I don't know if you call it gully in, in, uh, in American. Yeah, yeah, you, I would call you know it gully. gully. Okay. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And so there's this tight gully and I'm getting to it and I'm thinking, okay, there's, there's definitely there's got to be deer in there because it was quiet down the bottom and... There's a lot of stuff to hide in, and so I'm just sneaking along real slowly, and um, just using the binos all the time, and um, getting. I'm seeing these uh, kangaroos feeding further up in the gully, and uh, I just know, okay, you know, when there's kangaroos, you know, there's, there's potential of other deer hang, of deer hanging around, you know, because it's a good spot to hang out. So I'm just slowing down, and I get up to this big tree trunk, and I just stand in front of it and i'm looking at the ruse they're probably 50 meters away sort of thing yeah. and i'm just standing there thinking okay i mean any time a deer could walk by and uh, all of a sudden it just happens i mean after after standing there for 10 minutes there's a uh, yeah there's a sandbar walking down the opposite face and it's coming just straight towards me and i'm just like my heart starts raised and it's crazy and she comes into probably well at 15, at 15 yards she starts to slow down and then she comes a bit closer and then she starts looking up my way sort of thing, looking down, looking at my way again. And then she's slowly – and by then I've got, you know, the bow up in front of me, so I'm ready to draw. I'm, I haven't drawn yet, but I'm sort of halfway drawn. And then she's turning even more and more. And then, you know, when she's quartering on, I end up sending the arrow and it's going in. And then, well, she runs off with the arrow sticking out of her. And then the arrow falls out, and I can't really see well because it's it's foggy. Mm-hmm. So I try to follow her, look through the binos, and then it's really hard for me to pick her out. But I, I think I can see her ass up in there. And then uh, yeah, I'll just sit down and watch her. And um, I, and then I'm thinking she's dead, you know. And then I just burst into freaking tears, you know. I just start straight up crying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just crying. <laughs> I'm whining like nothing i've seen before you know <laughs> yeah right and i haven't tried that stuff before you know it's just such a big you know relief 
getting it done finally, you know, after hunting around for so long and then getting it done on a Samba deer, you know, which is pretty hard hunting. Right. It was, uh, yeah, it was a pretty special moment for me. Great story. And, um, That's awesome. Yeah. But then what happened, I mean, I'm going to make it short now. What happened was she actually, I didn't want to push it. So I was holding back because I wasn't sure of the shot. It it ends up, um, the shot ends up not being as good as I hoped. It was only one lung. She walks down into the gully and then she, she expires there. So I'm just sitting there watching her go down and die. And it probably takes a total of, I don't know, 15 minutes after I shot her. So I was feeling pretty bad, but at the same time, pretty good. It was it was sort of mixed emotions, um, but then I got the captain in there and he helped me drag out the meat and yeah we carved up the meat and it was yeah beautiful it was beautiful so that was an awesome hunt beautiful love it yeah so you're a you're you're an omnivore as as most of us are here on the show and you um, do you do a lot of the catch and cooks like are you are you killing meat and then or killing and then cooking some meat at camp yeah mate I'm I'm starting to do that a lot more now okay. Um, and what I like to do is just you, you do you know the dirty do you know dirty steak like where you just cut up like a small chunk of meat and then you know you blow blow away all the ashes from the coals and then you cook it just straight on the coals. Really? Yeah, it's awesome. Okay, it's awesome because you because you cook it so it doesn't take a lot of time to cook it. Sure. And you just put it on there, flip it around, you know, like a minute on each side, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, it's just brilliant. You know, you get the red red inside the the really barbecue sort of thing out on flavor on the outside and it's just well you need a bit of salt so i carry a bit of salt and then salt on the flesh and then yeah it's beautiful either yeah. that or that you can take like a rock in in the fire and <clears throat> use that as a plate so sure I, yeah okay I'll do that. i do that a little bit but yeah i was gonna say it's it, it's it sounds like yeah, a dirty steak. That's. It sounds like it, it can be. Uh, uh, it has the smoky flavor from the wood and the smoke, and uh, mm. a little bit of seasoning, and you're good to go. Yeah, there's your protein no, for really the good. day with a, a good flavor, <laughs> right? Yeah, and, yeah. You can't you can't rely on that though. I mean, you, you've got to bring your own food, but no, it's, sure. It's a good yeah, way. yeah. You're not going to yeah. count on it, but yeah. if you have well, it, no, you I'm, have I'm, it. <clears throat> yeah, I'm doing a lot of you know carrying out the meat as well. So I'm, what I'm doing most of the time is I debone the animal instead of gutting it and that. So debone it and just put it in the pack and, and walk it out. Yeah, gotcha. And then and eat some on the way. Yeah, I've noticed also that <clears throat> some of your stuff when you get back home, some of it looks like you're into uh, some other culinary adventures like curry, for example. Mm, yep, yep. Done a few curries on the uh, from the tar, and I managed to get a chamois as well. You know the chamois, chamois. I don't know how you pronounce chamois. it in the states. Good. Chamois. You know the chamois? I don't think I do, no. So there's, they're this um, mountain antelope, I think you'd, you'd call them. You're going to need to look it up because maybe you've seen, you'd, you'd have okay. seen pictures of them. Yeah, okay. so chamois. So that's C-H-A-M-O-I-S. Okay. Anyways, it's a mountain mountain antelope and they're sort of like the tar, but they come lower down as well on the west coast. Okay. Um, so yeah, I did, did curries of, of both chamois and tar and that's, that's awesome eating. And, uh, and can you tell yeah. us a little bit about how you make your curry? I'm curious. Yeah, well, you you start by it's a lot of different spices. So it's cinnamon, it's freaking just a whole lot. I think like eight eight or ten different spices go into this thing. Okay. Anyways, you start. You cut up a few onions. Um, you just quickly fry these onions with the with the different spices in them in the pan. Then you put that in the slow cooker, and then you quickly fry up the meat as well. Put that in the slow cooker as well, and then you add tomato and a couple other spices, salt, pepper, whatever, and then you just slow cook it for three hours sort of thing. Beautiful. And then, yeah, it's just even, you know, because if the meat hasn't, you know, you know, matured yet, you can, uh, it's, uh, you can eat a lot. Meat is good when it's fresh still because it cooks for that long. Right. Um, yeah, and it's a good way of eating sc- scrap meat, like meat with a lot of tenon in it. Yep. Break it right down. Yeah. yeah, and then you know, just serve it up with Greek yogurt and a bit of naan bread, garlic naan bread. Sure. Oh yeah, that stuff's good. And yeah, so that's a really good dish. And yeah, you yeah, I just tend to make like a whole heap, like a big portion of it. Yeah, beautiful. But I mean, like with cooking, a lot of it's a lot of, especially back home here in Denmark. You know, I don't know what it's like in some, you know other places, but a lot of people they misunderstand a lot of of how good game really can be because they're used to people overcooking the, the shit you know because it's they're used to cooking food with a lot of fat in it but you know as you know game is so lean and you you need to cook it the right way to to get the right results and, and when you do you know when you need 
when you know how to cook it, it's just the best you can get, you know. And, um, yeah, so I tend to, well, you know, steaks and all that sort of stuff, just really quickly. I like it I like it red on the inside. Just cook it really quickly on the outside, and, and that's, how, that's how I prefer it anyways. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Very good. All right. I've got 10 rapid fire questions for you, Ulrich. Yeah. I didn't prep you for these, but just to get to know you a little bit better. Go for it. All right. What's your number one hunting tip of all time? Oh, that's a tough one, hunting tip. Well, um, okay, hunting tip. Um, it, your mentality is probably like being mentally strong. Well, saying yeah, being mentally strong is, is bigger than being physically strong or physically fit. So yeah. if you if you're able to keep pushing and keep believing in it, that's probably the number one is, is belief. And then yeah, meant being mentally strong is probably <laughs> the best way to get success. Yeah, spend the time in, out in the woods. Spend the time in yeah. <laughs> gotcha. That's that's probably it. Probably sucks. I don't know. <laughs> no, no, no. That's those are all valid and, points. Yeah, absolutely. And hunt the wind, which is probably said pretty often. I don't know. Right. Yeah. That's, all yep. of those are essentials yeah. to hunting success. No question. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We all have these items. Uh, maybe you don't. Maybe you do. A lot of us do have these little, I don't know, call them good luck charms, call them whatever you want. Sometimes if we forget it at home, at base camp, in the truck, mm. it drives us crazy if we don't have it with us. What's that one thing for you? Oh, actually, I don't have one of those. I, I think what I always want to bring is, is the uh, neck gator. I was talking to you about the neck gator and the, the merino thing. I don't think I've hunted without a merino base layer on. Okay. All right, so I think a, maybe that's that's one, and then the other one's probably face paint. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. It has, it has become sort of a thing. Almost even when I'm rifle hunting, I feel like. Okay. Right. okay. <laughs> yep. Uh, makes total sense. All right. What's your biggest pet peeve in life? <laughs> What's that? What's your biggest pet peeve in life? <laughs> what is that? What does that mean? All right. So a pet peeve is something that one thing that really bugs you. It's not really a super. It's not like a, a, a global importance thing, but to you, it might be a bad driver. It might be. Uh, just these little idiosyncrasies that other people have that drives you crazy. Um, I don't know if if, uh, if you've got one if of those. Some, uh, something that ticks me off. Yeah, oh. something that ticks you off. Mm. Hey, I'm not really sure. I I'm, I think I'm pretty good at just letting things slip. Okay. Oh, some people don't have them, but uh, usually, some, yeah. You know, sometimes most people have uh, something that just drives them crazy. Like I hate doing things twice that only need to be done once. That's like one of my biggest pet peeves. Yeah, gotcha. No, I can't. Nothing. Come okay. <clears throat> no. Okay. How old are you today, Ulrich? <laughs> Just turned 26. 26. All right. <clears throat> yeah. After a lifetime uh, of 26 years <clears throat> of experience, what would you tell the 13-year-old Ulrich Orskov, knowing what you know today? Mm. Keep doing what you love. I mean, just I, I don't have, I don't think I have any regrets, you know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, keep doing what you what you love doing. Okay. You, you're at a hunting convention somewhere in the world, and a stranger comes up to you mm -hmm. and strikes up a conversation. They ask you what you do for a living. What do you tell them? What I do for – oh, well, I study to be a vet, and I don't make a living from it. But we actually do get paid to study here in Denmark, um, so I'm pretty fortunate with that, which is one of the reasons I, I get to travel as well. So I write articles as well. Okay. Um, I've taken student loans to be able to afford you know, going out, but I teach – teach hunting license, write articles, and do massive loans. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, very yeah. good. Um, what did you have for breakfast this morning? Oh, every morning is rye bread. Do you know rye bread? Oh, yeah, one of my yeah. favorites. So I do, I do three pieces of rye bread and three eggs, and then if I've got the time, you know, uh, zucchini, zucchini, what do you call it? Yep. Yeah, and, zucchini, yeah. And sometime, sometimes eggplant. A bit mm. of tomato, and then yeah, that's my breakfast. Yeah, delicious. Sounds sounds yeah. good. Yeah, it's good. All right, you uh, you can have your own billboard. Do you have billboards in Denmark on the oh. side of a highway? Big big canvases oh. that yep. do advertising. Yep. All right. Okay. Okay. You get to have one of those, and it's a mm. bl blank canvas. You can put anything that you want on it. What would it say? What would it say? Okay, just something. Just a text or something. Mm. What would it say? What would it say? Like, mm. What would you want to tell the world or get the world to go do or mm. a hashtag? Maybe, or maybe, maybe get outside. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah. If I say the word successful to you, who's the first person that pops into your head and why? Mm, who's the first person? 
I think I'm pretty successful. Um, okay. Successful in, in being happy. And okay. that's what I would describe success as, not, not you know, being happy because money, I mean, it doesn't buy you happiness and it really doesn't. I mean, it gives you freedom to do stuff, but you can't really say it gives you happiness. So I'm just going to say whatever makes you happy. And if, you, if you're really happy, I mean, that's freaking, that's that's the best you, best success you can have. So Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. All right. What's a typical day in your life look like? Well, right now I'm back in freaking dark Denmark. Um, <laughs> I don't have a don't, don't have a lot of light here. It's been pretty sad coming back. It was good in the beginning, but it's pretty pretty sad now. So I get up in the morning. I do I go over to the right now. It's not that big days, but we go over and then we look at X-rays. Okay. And then we sit down in groups, we talk about them, write something down, and then we do presentations, whatever. And uh, yeah, so at, at the at the moment we're looking at X-rays and ultrasound and, and that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yep. yep. Makes sense. Yep. All right. And then finally, what's a typical hunting day in your life look like? Well, most of the days I've done, you know, the day hunts. So usually I don't see the camp in, in daylight. I sort of walk out when it's when it's dark still. And then, you know, you see the sunrise and you stay high, you sit down and then you start to watch the animals and you start to pick out where you're going to walk and, and there because you just don't walk anywhere you want to go in there and then. I don't know. Sort of midday, I tend to, I tend to sit sit down and have my have my lunch, and then after that, I fall asleep. I just can't I can't stay awake, and I think it's a good thing, you know, having a break midday to to be able to stay fresh. You know, you can you could keep pushing on, but then what I found is just you just don't keep the you just don't pay as much attention. You're not as sharp as as you are when you when you know you take that half hour hour nap sort of thing. So I tend to hunker down and. And take a nap and, um, yeah, drink a lot of coffee and then I get going again. And then usually I'm, I don't know, a couple of kilometers away from camp, so I usually walk back in the dark and, yeah, that's a, nice. that's a good hunting day, yeah. All right. Well, how do you take your coffee? Um, I actually started because I couldn't find the the, uh, the instant one I liked. I started using um, plunger coffee but in, in like a tea bag sort of thing. So I actually makes sense. Using, All right, yeah, I get yeah, that. Yeah, was, yeah, that makes that a lot of sense. Awesome. Yeah, so I, I really enjoy. I really enjoy that, even though it was a bit extra weight. I mean, everything, every weight, all the weight, just counts when you, you know, walking around the mountains, and, and you you realize that pretty quickly that you want to try and cut down. So, anyways, that was really good coffee. Excellent. Very good. Mm. All right, those are the ten rapid fire questions. And mm. Appreciate you going through that exercise with us, Ulrich. <laughs> yeah, no worries. No worries. Excellent, man. Well, if we didn't talk about enough stuff here today and we didn't answer somebody's question that's listening to this how can we find more information about you how can we connect with you mm, good question i've got where i'm most active is on facebook i've got a hunting page there okay and so it's called orskov hunting okay and it's o-r-s-k-o-v -O hunting um so i do my i do i upload like short bits of, of me yeah hunting around and i try to upload something every other day and keep it going and so it sort of feels like it's real time so you can catch me there or i've got an instagram not as active there but it's also also hunting and then i've got my youtube channel which is more sort of my edited stuff which is like the samba hunt we talked about um so my youtube is probably just my name ulrich Orskov. um or you'd be able to just go in and say bore charge arrow through the heart or something <laughs> <laughs> right right and, and you should find it you'll yeah. find it yeah excellent Ulrich, this has been an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. And no, it's been I, awesome being on you, man. Thank you. I've enjoyed listening to your stories, and it's kind of gotten us out of our typical element here that uh, I think a lot of our audience is, is used to, and it's fun. It's fun to you know explore abroad uh, vicariously through you, so I appreciate you being very detailed and letting us know what it's like out there. Mm, no, it's been good talking about it. I want to get to know more about whitetail hunting because that's something I don't don't know a lot about. Seems like you seems like your tree stand hunting a lot. Is that it? It depends. Depends on yep. which you know, like like anywhere. Uh, the U.S. has a, a huge variety of topography and landscape, and yep. depending upon where you want to hunt, will determine what the best technique and style of hunting is, or even yeah. what time of year, based off of what uh, you have for weather and elements. Mm, yeah, so, sure. Yeah, you know, for example, you know, early season in in my neck of the woods, uh, you, you're probably bow hunting. You're probably going to try to mm. keen on food sources. Oh yeah. Then as as the the rut uh, kicks in, 
um, you, you may the gun seasons typically open up, uh, so you you may change your style. You may t- go to a still hunt. You may uh, get up into the mountains and get some mm. of the the ridge bucks that are hunting up there. And mm. then after that, uh, if if snow falls, then it turns. But into they're, a, they're pretty they're pretty hard hunting, aren't they? That's what I sort of gather. They can be they're pretty. They can yeah. be. Uh, you know, it depends on the population where you live in New Hampshire. We have a very low population, so it gets kind of challenging mm. to uh, routinely come across anything that has good antlers, for example. Um, mm. But you'll, you'll see deer, and, and then you know, the the snow is it brings this whole new element to the Northeast, especially called tracking, where you you identify a large buck track and you mm. and you follow it and you follow it and you follow it wherever it leads you because there's, <laughs> there's really no private land well, there is but it's very rare that you would bump into a piece where you couldn't hum, hunt it it's uh wow. goes back to some colonial days uh beginning of the united states that new england has this like tradition where you can hunt out you can cross anybody's land unless they tell you not to as opposed to Mm. other mentalities where you can't cross that's pretty good it is very good it's very handy it is pretty good yes i mean sounds a lot not like denmark (laughs) right a lot of freedoms there so that's uh, it's a much different aspect i mean you still respect landowners and their property and things like that but you do have the right as a citizen Mm. in in a lot of these states in the northeast to simply cross somebody's land unless they post a sign on Mm. their property that tells you otherwise that's cool yeah it's pretty neat Uh, I I appreciate you coming on the show and spending some time with us. No worries, Mike. Well, thanks to Ulrich for joining us on the Big Buck Red Street Deer Hunting Podcast. It's always fascinating to learn how hunting is done around the world. We so often think of whitetail hunting on the East Coast versus muleys or elk on, on the Western Plains. There's so much more hunting that's done around the world, we tend not to think about it. I don't think I've ever thought about hunting in Denmark. From our previous show that we've done with guests from England, we certainly know about the European deer, but forget that that there's more hunting to be done in other parts of Europe. And to really break down the similarities and the differences of going all the way to New Zealand to hunt species that we don't have in the United States is just a, a great exploration of hunters on a global basis. I guess we're all part of a hunting community that spans the globe and it was fun to bring it home here and and again thanks to Ulrich for jumping on a Skype line all all the way across the pond the uh, technology is absolutely phenomenal well, Dusty do we have a Chubby Tines tip of the week yeah Jay I've got a tip of the week this week the Chubby Tines tip of the week is sponsored by Morse's Sporting Goods firearms use firearms bows use bows located at 85 Kentucky Falls Road in Hillsborough New Hampshire Give Jim a call at 603-464-3444, morsessportinggoods.com. Your dollars go further in New Hampshire. There's no sales tax. Morse's Sporting Goods. You know, a lot of people ask me, you know, where the rut's going on? They, they have a doe come in, and they're, they're hunting a scrape. Let's, let's say, for instance, Jay, we're, we're hunting over a, a fresh scrape, and it's an active scrape that uh, maybe multiple bucks have been hitting, and, and maybe it's a public scrape. But a lot of guys tend to sit up on a scrape, and... Uh, you know, they say, man, I had a doe come in and she, she messed around this scrape for a good while. And, and uh, you know, I, I thought to myself, what's she doing? What's going on? Well, you know, a, a, a doe in heat will come into a scrape and she may linger there. What I mean by that, she's, she's just hanging out and she's kind of waiting on a buck to show up to uh, get her, get the attention of him. And, and she may hang out there for a few hours during the day. And uh, a lot of guys will get tired of looking at her and maybe shoot her and and that's something that uh, I've noticed over time that uh, doe and heat will come to a scrape and just linger around. She'll just meal around. She may stay 20, 50 yards, 75 yards, but it seems like you always get a visual on her and hang out by that, that scrape. And, and over the years, it just seems like every time I see one do that, I, I got to kind of laugh and snicker a little bit because there's a lot of times that when a, when a doe comes in and lingers around a scrape like that, she ends up getting an arrow through her because it just seems like it's a prime opportunity. But that's always not the best scenario to, to go ahead and harvest her. Give her give her a chance and let her keep lingering around there. And long as she stays uh, out of your wind zone so you don't get busted, it could be a good opportunity for you to uh, have that mature buck come in uh, looking for a hot doe and, and she kind of just trap him there. And, and once he finds her, he's going to hang out with her. So be careful on letting that uh, meat missile fly when a hot doe is coming in to linger around a scrape. Dusty, where can we find you when you're not hanging out here in the studios with me? Uh, shoot me an email, dusty at 
bigbuckregistry.com. You can look me up on Instagram and Twitter at Chasing Antler, Facebook.com forward slash Chubby Tines Outdoors. Jay, where can the people reach out to you when you're not on the mic? Likewise, you can shoot me an email, jay at bigbuckregistry.com, and you can visit us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. We're also on Twitter, which is twitter.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. We are also on Instagram, instagram.com forward slash bigbuckregistry, and YouTube, which is youtube.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. On YouTube, you can listen to all of our podcasts in their entirety. As far as videos are concerned, it's a boring video, but the audio content is there, so you can actually listen to our podcast. You can also listen to all of our live shows that we've done on Thursday nights when we do do them, and we've gone back and interviewed, re-interviewed a lot of our previous guests we had on the show just to put a face to a voice, let's put it that way. You can always listen to our show on other places as well, not just YouTube. We're found on iTunes, iHeartRadio, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, and Blueberry. And if you would like to submit a buck to our page for consideration and be featured on our page in front of 250,000 diehard deer hunting fans, all you have to do is go to bigbuckredstreet.com forward slash my buck and all of the instructions will be right there. I think that's pretty much everywhere we're at. I think that's a wrap, Dusty. That's a whole lot of big buck, Jay. Sure is. I'm Jay Scott. I'm Dusty Phillips. And this is the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. We'll see you next week. (laughs) 